Hello, welcome to Torah Foundation in Yeshua. Um, today we're going to go over a teaching that we just did at our uh, Sukkot just a couple weeks ago. Um, this was the teaching that was done on the first night, and um, the name of it is called The Journey to Sukkot. And we're going to start by reading Leviticus 23, verses 33 through 36, and then we're going to skip down and do verse 39 through 43. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles, for seven days to the Lord. On the first day there shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. For seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall have a holy convocation, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. It is a sacred assembly. You shall do no customary work on it. Also, on the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep the feast of the Lord for seven days. On the first day there shall be a Sabbath rest, and on the eighth day a Sabbath rest. And you shall take for yourselves on the first day the fruit of beautiful trees, branches of palm trees, and of burrows, um, uh, or, or boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook. You shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. You shall keep it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the in the year. And it shall be a statute forever in your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. Um, you shall dwell in booths for seven days. All who are native Israelites shall dwell in booths. That your generations um, may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths. When I brought them out of the land of Egypt, I am the Lord your God. Okay, Sukkot, also known as the Feast of Tabernacles. It's a joyous time as it wraps up the feast cycle of the year. Those who follow Torah eagerly wait the celebration and memorial each and every year. We need to see the prophetic shadow it cast um, of the wedding feast. What we see acknowledged in the celebration is the dwelling presence of Yah and the Sukkah. Yah dwelt with the ancient Israelites in the tabernacle, in the wilderness, and later on in the temple in Jerusalem. What does this all mean and foreshadow? It all points to this final Sukkot, the wedding feast and the last eight day, the millennial reign. Let's take a look at all, uh, let's, let's take a look at all this to understand what our journey to Sukkot is. Let's start with uh, Hebrews. Let's go to the eighth chapter and let's read verses one through five. Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also having something to offer. For if we were uh, for if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy in shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. The true tent or tabernacle is what Yah established in heaven. What was here on earth was just a copy or shadow of the real tabernacle. We need to understand them both and their purpose. Let's read uh, Revelation 15 verses 1 through 3. And then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having seven last plagues. And for in them the wrath of God is complete. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. And those who have victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps, uh, having harps of God. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Okay, so first... Let's note that they sang both the Song of Moses and the Song of the Lamb. Moses represents the Torah, the instructions of Yah. The Lamb represents the Passover by its blood. Death, brought by the destroyer, passes over us who apply that blood. To have victory over the beast requires the Torah and the Lamb. 
There's much study here for another time, but let's continue on um, with Revelation 5 right now. And we're going to read, let's see, where are we at? Or I, I said Revelation 5, I'm sorry, I mean Revelation 15. And uh, we're going to read verses 4 through 8 now. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you. For your judgments have been manifested, and all these things I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And out of the temple came the seven angels, having seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, and having their chest girded with golden bands. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God and lives forever and ever. The temple was filled with smoke and the glory of God and from his power. And no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. It's interesting to see that these angels came out of the temple to pour out Yah's wrath. Why from out of the temple in heaven? Let's keep that in mind as we continue. Let's go to Matthew um, chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. In this manner, therefore pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are to pray Yah's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. What is in heaven is also modeled on earth. So Yah's will for the tabernacle on earth is a picture of what's in heaven. It represents what's in heaven. Let's go to Exodus chapter 25 and let's see. We're going to be reading um, verses 1 through 9 it looks like. Actually I'm not sure if we're reading all that. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering from everyone who gives it willingly with his heart, shall take, um, you shall take my offering. And this is the offering which you shall take from them, gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, scarlet thread, fine linen, and goat's hair, ram skins dyed red, badger skins, and acacia wood, oil for the light, and spices for the anointing oil, and for the sweet incense, onks, stones, and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, according to all I show you, that is, the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of its furnishings, just so you shall make it. Okay, so Yah gave Moses the command to build a holy set-apart place for him to dwell, for him to dwell in close to his people. It must be built to the exact instructions that Yah gave. When it was built Yah's way, his presence could manifest. The set apart dwelling place of Yah to be with his people, uh, the set apart dwelling place of Yah to be with his people was and is his will. It can't be built their way or our way, but only how he says, completely set apart by his definition. It becomes defiled by not following the instructions. Let's look at um, Psalm 69 verse 9. Because zeal for your house has eaten me up and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. Our zeal for his house should be an ultimate concern. We want it his way, his design. Um, let's look at something here. Let's go to John chapter 2 and we're going to read verses 13 through 17. Now the Passover of the Jews uh, was at hand, and Yeshua went up to Jerusalem. He found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, and poured out the money changers' money, and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house has eaten me up. And that's what we just read there in, in Psalms. So Yeshua drove them out for defiling the temple. And um, if you look at this account in Matthew, he said the temple was a house of prayer. We see his zeal for the place where Yah chose to call his name. Let's uh, 
Actually, let's keep on reading there. And let's go back to uh, John and let's read um, 2 verses 18 through 21. So the Jews answered and said to him, What sign do you show us since you do these things? Yeshua answered and said to them, Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And the Jews said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple. And will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. So now we see here Yeshua had periled his physical body to the temple. And he had the spirit dwelling within him. But we see he was declaring defilement of the temple and was attempting to set it back in order, which is a foreshadow of him also setting us in order as a dwelling place for the spirit. He, uh, he showed us how to walk in Torah and to be set apart. Holiness, being set apart, is not a characteristic. It is obedience. Observing the Sabbath and the feast sets you apart. Living the Torah sets you apart. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 20, verses 7 and 8. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy. For I am the Lord your God, and you shall keep my statutes and perform them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. So we are to consecrate ourselves. Dedicate ourselves to be holy. Set apart for Yah is set apart. He is the one who sanctifies us. How? By giving us the instructions or the Torah. Well, that's what defines what he calls set apart and we do them. Not doing what the people of the nations of the world do or doing the common thing. That's what we are commanded to be set apart from. We are building the set apart dwelling place of Yah on earth as it is in heaven. You see the parallels that we're painting here? If you are Israel, you worship him and live your life as he instructs, not to defile his dwelling place, whether it be the tabernacle, the temple, or our bodies. All the dwelling places of Yah. Doing what is right in your own eyes takes Yah off of his place of authority and puts you and puts um, your own ways higher than his. Self-worship over Yah. You must reflect and follow the heavenly design. Let's go to Psalms. Um, Psalms 19. We'll read verses 7 through 11. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than more than fine gold, sweeter than the honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. So we must have ears to hear the Torah, his instructions to build his dwelling place so that we can so that he can dwell with us. To build his building place, or to, I mean, I'm sorry, to build his dwelling place by the Torah is better than fine gold. So many pray for revival or a move of spirit, as they so call it, but he just wants to dwell with his people at all times. That's why he gave us his word, the Torah, to sanctify us. Remember, those that will have the victory over the beast and sing, um, those that have victory over the beast sing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb both the Torah and Yeshua, which really are one and the same. Let's read uh, 1 John. Let's see, 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. So by keeping Torah, we abide in Yeshua, and by abiding in him, we walk as he walked, which is keeping the Torah. It's all a circle that works together. Walking as Yeshua's walked is keeping the Torah perfectly. Now, not that we won't make mistakes, but he kept the Torah perfectly. His example is how we should walk as a dwelling place of Yah by his spirit. Let's go to John, the 16th chapter, and we'll read verse 13. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. So, the whole purpose of the Spirit dwelling within us is to guide us to truth. 
a reminder and teacher within us to walk in Torah. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 9 and then 16 and 17. Let's see. For we are God's fellow workers, and you are God's field. You are God's building. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in, uh, dwells in you? For if anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. We are Yah's building, the temple or the dwelling place of his spirit. We are set apart for him to dwell within us and, um, and, t and teaches us by his Torah and, by, and the spirit, speaking the Torah to our hearts so that by our obedience we don't defile ourselves so he can dwell there. It's this continuing circle in which all things work together for the end result of Yah dwelling with his people. Let's go to 2 Corinthians um, chapter 6, verses 16 through 18. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. The call to be set apart is what prepares us for Yah to dwell with us. Right now, he dwells within us in a limited measure by his spirit. This is preparing us to dwell with him in a much greater measure with the return of Yeshua for the marriage uh, for the marriage wedding feast and to reign over the earth for a thousand years. This is what our journey to Sukkot is all about. This is the time to fill our lamps with oil, awaiting his return to be prepared to be his bride. Let's read Revelation chapter 3. Verses 18 through 22. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and dine with him, and he will be with me. To him, um, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I have also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So Yeshua is making it clear here to the seven churches that they must be prepared, ready for his return. If they don't return or if they don't repent, they may not enter in. Let's go to Matthew 25 and let's read 1 through 13. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish one said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered and saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but rather go to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterwards, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you neither know the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. So we must be prepared with our, amp, with, our, with our lamps full of pure oil to be the bride. To enter in and to be the bride, we must have already gone through the crushing that produces the pure oil. 
When the bridegroom returns, we are ready to be wed with him. Deuteronomy 16, verses 13. You shall observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days. And when you, uh, when you have gathered from the threshing floor and uh, from your wine press. So with the foreshadowing of wine, we have to be a finished product of a fine wine removed from the wine press because we have already been through the crushing process. We then are prepared to be his bride. So we see this journey to Sukkot is one of preparation, preparation to be the bride. Yeshua said he would return for us. That leaves us in the position to do all that we are to commanded to do to be his set apart bride. Walk in the example that Yeshua set for us to obey the Torah and let it to be our uh, let it be our instructions on this path, which leads us to the way of restoration that Yah provided through Messiah, our salvation from Yah, and that there is our journey to the final Sukkot. Thank you very much for joining us.